Hello and welcome to The Print. Today we have with us Kavita Krishnan who is a senior uh, social and political activist and a former member of the CPIML. Thank you for joining us Kavita ji. Uh, you have been relieved from the party on your request and you wrote a Facebook post about it asking uh, that you said that you wanted to pursue some troubling political questions independently. Yeah. So would you please elaborate on what are those questions? Yeah, I think that, you know, the questions I face, uh, you know, and I've been facing for some months now, some time now, uh, basically they come out of uh, our experience here in India, mm -hmm. uh, experience of activists like me who are basically uh, watching with horror as uh, a democratic India. And we know that Indian democracy as it was had a lot of flaws. Uh, you know, in Hindi we say, the, the, it had a lot of weaknesses out of which, uh, you know, these fascist forces have arisen. Hindu supremacist forces have become successful. But we are watching a democracy, a functioning democracy, being turned into, uh, you know, they are gradually turned into a one leader, one party, uh, one ideology, one religion kind of rule. Hmm. If BJP and Narendra Modi have their way, that is what they want to achieve. They have said that they want an opposition mukt Bharat. You know, Congress mukt means opposition mukt basically because Congress is the largest opposition party. So, you know, uh, when they say that, then, you know, we are fighting that, right? We are fighting to protect multi-party democracy. We are fighting to protect the idea that the citizen uh, deserves to be protected from the power of the state. The state should not be able to arbitrarily pick you up because they don't like you and put you away under, under UAP, all of that, right? So I think when we are fighting here on those things, I felt the need to look around us a little and look at the larger climate in this region in which this fight is happening. Mm -hmm. So China, for instance, now the tendency in India is to look at China uh, specifically as a socialist country. It's not just the left, but otherwise also the idea is to look at China as though uh, and also, you know, even China's opponents in India will talk, you know, uh, uh, very admiringly about its authoritarianism, about the fact that it has achieved, you know, it is getting rid of poverty, this, that. And, um, you know, it's, it's anti-worker labor laws. Narendra Modi will boast about them here, you know, uh, BJP boasts about them here. My point is that uh, here in our neighborhood is a country which is actually, uh, you know, claiming to be socialist, but essentially its ideology is a, a Han majoritarian nationalism. It is uh, putting Uyghur Muslim minorities, which is also a nationality minority, in concentration camps in the name of war on terror. It is backing the Myanmar military, which is doing genocide to <laughs> Rohingya Muslims. Uh, it is using things like facial recognition technology and other, you know, it is, it is, it is the model for a state which does not give its citizens any rights, but which only demands obedience and duties. Again, something else which Narendra Modi keeps saying that what is all this talk of rights, talk about duties. You know, so a good citizen is going to just, you know, obey the government, basically. So can we not connect these things? You know, if we if we look around us, there is an obvious connection that, you know, India's, India's Islamophobic policies of the Modi regime, Modi using facial recognition technology, which China also uses against its uh, protesters in India, which China uses against its citizens, um, you know, and, and this, uh, you know, this, uh, this, the Modi regime also wanting to achieve something which China does next door, you know. So I think that, uh, you know, we look far off at the Hitler model and all of that. And of course, there's a lot to learn from that history. But there's also a lot to learn from looking next door, right? So the ability, I think the, uh, I think we, I, I'm feeling the need to connect these dots much more. Yeah. You talked about the obvious connection and then yeah. you're talking about that these questions yeah. uh, are not being raised enough and especially in the leftist uh, ecosystem. Actually, they're not being raised at all. See, the mm -hmm. rightist ecosystem doesn't raise them because it believes that that's the correct policy, right? So they are uh, perfectly admiring. They only use it as a whataboutery for the left, right? Mm. So actually, uh, CPIML did raise this. They do uh, condemn China for uh, its Uyghur Muslim policy and a lot of other things. It has a pretty critical opinion of China. Mm -hmm. But I think that the criticism uh, tends to be, uh, you know, in general on the part of, I don't mean only left party people, but even like general non-left people also. Generally, the tendency, ten you tend to be a little muted 
uh, when it comes to China because you don't think of China as the big bad enemy. You think America is, you know, uh, imperialist and all of that. You don't really, you aren't able to recognize uh, what China is doing in this neighborhood, what China is doing in Africa, what China is, uh, and the fact that China is implicated also mm -hmm. as Narendra Modi is, as the Myanmar military is, in creating this uh, very undemocratic, Islamophobic, uh, political climate in this particular region. Mm -hmm. So I feel that this is something we cannot afford to ignore. And on the left, I feel, is it enough to just say, okay, this is a failed socialism. This mm -hmm. is not really a good socialist model. You know, uh, other left parties won't even say that. They'll say, oh, it's a great socialism. But CPIML may say, other parties may say, they may say critical, critically about it. But it's not enough. I feel that in order to really understand the relationship between uh, you know, the uh, ideologies we are fighting in India today, fascism, authoritarianism, we are fighting today, in order to really understand how it works, why people may support such an authoritarianism in India, we also have to try and understand what are the ways in which the Chinese regime manages to get some support for itself in China, right, in spite of such repression. Mm -hmm. In order to understand that, we have to understand that people who are supporting these regimes don't always realize that they are supporting a bad thing. They think, okay, some repression is necessary. We have to give up some freedoms all for the greater good mm -hmm. with capital G, G. Yeah. Okay, so the minute you understand that, I think your fight becomes in some ways more challenging, but also uh, your job becomes a little bit clearer. You're not just, you know, you can't just preach how to be good to people who are being communal or, you know, supporting uh, some authoritarian uh, behavior, some... Uh, you know, totalitarian or dictator, mm -hmm. dictatorial behavior, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, in order to understand the connections, we need to be able to look uh, more clearly at uh, the connections between these. Yeah. yeah All right. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. a recent interview, you were also you also talked about how China is a fascist regime, a fa no, not a fascist country, but a totalitarian, totalitarian regime. Uh, would you elaborate on that for our viewers? Well, I think that you know, very right. briefly, I would say that look, uh, the, for the people experiencing the uh, one party rule. Okay, uh, I don't think the people experiencing it necessarily, uh, this is not about saying that a one party rule by a fascist like Hitler is worse than a one party rule of a whatever totalitarian like Stalin or Xi or something, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about, it's not just about saying this is better, that is worse, this is better, that is worse. Mm -hmm. The point is that a one party rule itself is uh, pretty terrible, you know. And the fact that the state, uh, uh, the, 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 there is nothing to protect the citizen from the state because the state claims to be acting for the good of everybody. Sabka saath, sabka vikas. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means if I am doing sabka saath, then uh, let me have the unbridled power to do what I like, bulldoze somebody's house without any law to stop me. And I'm doing it and, you know, so what is it that makes people think it's okay to do this? It's okay to behave lawlessly. It's okay to use the state power like this, you know, to selectively uh, criminalize somebody, knock somebody's house down, etc. We are fighting this in India. So in order to understand how this works, I think we also need to understand how it works, not only in a Hitler type regime, but even in a regime where uh, supposedly they're doing, you know, they're they they are set setting out to do good. Okay, mm -hmm. so suppose uh, suppose a socialist regime says, "Oh, but we are feeding people. We've lifted China out of poverty. There was industrialization in the Soviet Union. You know, bada chamatkari. You know, such miraculous um, industrialization in the Soviet Union. Whatever. So these are all good stuff we did, right? And a lot of uh, defendants of these rules uh, of these kinds of regimes would say that. But I'm reminded of what uh, Bertolt Brecht said about uh, the bread of justice. Okay, so we all know we need daily bread." You can't say, okay, I gave you bread last year, so you don't need bread for the whole mm -hmm. year next. We do need bread. So a, a state that does not give its people enough to eat, where people are hungry, where people are poor, where people don't have housing, where people don't have education, don't have health care, whether that's the US of A or India, come on, these are poor democracies because, you know, part of the democratic model, you cannot be free on an empty stomach, right? No doubt, no doubt about it. So absolutely while saying that, the Corollary is also true that a regime which gives and they always give to some section of the people. Uh, Soviet Union could feed some people uh, well because it starved the Ukrainians, you know, the Ukrainian farmers. It grabbed mm -hmm. all their grain, right? Mm -hmm. So China, okay, it has done certain things. It is saying, okay, I'm providing food, I'm providing this and that, right? 
the point is that if you are not giving also the bread of justice which is what bresh described that and he said the bread of justice shouldn't be something you have to wait for 3 decades and then get it which is what it is like in india actually mm. point is bread of justice he says is something you should get like daily nutritious bread and if a regime is not giving that bread of justice if you are not free to speak against the regime to criticize it to build a movement against it to build a feminist organization to build a trade union whatever it is you want to do okay to write something uh, subversive about the leader whatever it is if you don't have those freedoms then you cannot claim that you are a regime that is doing good and no matter even whatever your intentions as a state the point is that i think what we learn from our struggles in a country like india is that any person anywhere in the world deserves to have the protection from the might of the state so you know i'm saying that uh, okay indian democracy you know it has 72 holes it has so many weaknesses it has nice things on paper but actually in practice the poor the oppressed don't get the benefits of that democracy and we are fighting to make it a better place mm -hmm. we are fighting to defeat this fascism but we also want india to be a much more robust democracy right we all if we say you know what is that robust democracy going to look like you may call it you know say socialism or whatever but for it to be truly democratic then you you would say that well something we learnt in the course of these struggles we should have then no like i i say in joke to my friends that i don't want a revolution in which there's no habeas corpus mm -hmm. okay which means where the state can not you know i want a revolution where the state cannot arrest me arbitrarily or shoot me arbitrarily or whatever it is mm -hmm. just because it's a revolutionary state and which says nice things and wants to do good maybe intentionally doesn't mean that it all power should be concentrated in that state you know uh, if it it cannot claim oh we are acting on behalf of the, all the workers and all of that and therefore we get to do what we like no i think that that is not something which is a good thing and that is certainly not something uh, of the free society which uh, you know marxists set out to fight for either mm -hmm. so i think that uh, as we fight here in india for these um you know to protect whatever democratic rights there are on paper try and translate them to the ground as we fight against the rapid erosion of our freedoms in india i think we just owe it to our you know the citizens of the world no matter where they live even if they live in north korea or china or wherever vietnam or wherever in countries which are which call themselves socialist we owe it to those people there uh to say that they deserve the same rights we are fighting for mm. they deserve to have the right to fight for the same rights we are fighting for mm. and uh, well uh, if somebody is putting an entire community in concentration camps if some state is doing that that state mm. is a nightmare state that state is not as you know you stop calling it a, uh, a you know stop saying oh it's just making maybe some little mistakes or something no it's pretty terrible now we call uh what america does you know american imperialism invasion terrible right we know we we uh, we in india do it in india in general i don't mean just the left but citizens in general have come out against imperialism they have come out in solidarity with iraq with afghanistan with vietnam with palestine all of that well we should be able to come out likewise with a solidarity with ukraine okay why is it that in india the you know if you look at social media and general society then the right wing the left wing you know ordinary citizens even muslim minorities large number of them tend to be pro putin why because they are victims of putin propaganda here we should be you know we owe it as indian citizens to be fighting that propaganda mm -hmm. um and last of all i think uh, you know the other thing uh, i think is that if you are um when you criticize the america for instance for its imperialism the fact that american democracy you know it's not just fallen from the heaven there is a background it its prosperity is based on its uh, history of slavery its prosperity is based on imperialist uh, plunder of latin america all of that now today there is a movement in the usa saying teach these facts in schools teach the history of slavery in schools and the far right is opposing it trump supporters are opposing it So there is a movement and obviously if you ask us we would say absolutely we should face up to our history mm -hmm. likewise in india we would say well why are you removing uh, the uh, history of uh, you know uh, who killed gandhi and why you know the fact that a hindu supremacist man killed gandhi why are you removing that from the why are you removing that from the from the from the textbooks uh, why are you creating textbooks which make it look as though 
um, you know, must, why are you whitewashing, you know, Gujarat 2002 out of the textbooks or, you know, all of that, right? So, uh, obviously, these are questions. Likewise, if we were to speak to, say, Ukrainians or Kazakh people or, uh, you know, um, uh, people of uh, Romania or, uh, you know, Bulgaria, whatever it is, you speak to people in countries that were once Soviet colonies or mm -hmm. victims of Soviet invasions, uh, they will tell you that we want to teach the history of the Soviet Union and its repression in our textbooks, right? Would they not have a right to do that? Of course they won't. We should stand with them. We should always stand, uh, stand with the victims of those who are uh, mm -hmm. subjected to oppression. Uh, you also uh, received uh, online trolli trolling mm -hmm. after your, you announced your decision and mm -hmm. uh, also pertaining to the things that you said, why do Indian communist leaders are afraid to really ask and discuss these questions publicly? Uh, well, I don't think it's, uh, it would be unfair to say Indian communist leaders. Mm -hmm. Let me make it very clear that, you know, I left the CPIML and the CPIML left me, mm -hmm. but nobody from the CPIML has called me names and I haven't called the CPIML any names and we are mm -hmm. still, you know, I still have a great deal of affection and admiration for that party. Right. And uh, I think it's a very courageous party that has not only had, uh, that is not only largely very democratic, but has also had a democratizing um, influence in society vis-a-vis -vis caste and gender and all of that. So that is remarkable. I think the trolling is basically by uh, uh, members of a single party, mm -hmm. largely, which is basically the CPIM, and then a couple of other kind of small sectarian kind of cult. I would not even call them parties, I'd call them cults. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of them around. So they have been trolling me when I was an ML leader also. So they were trolling the ML other leaders also, like mm -hmm. for ever and I think that you know the way they respond is very telling because I think it's a, it's a mirror image of how it's how a lot of people who are victims of propaganda respond to facts respond to something that challenges their uh, you know ideological worldview right suppose I were to say to uh, you know some uh, you know, on on social media or whatever that um, you know the there, there is a history in India of the police and the, even the armed forces uh, indulging in custodial killings and custodial torture. In fact, it's very much part of the ordinary culture of policing in India. And mm -hmm. it is especially bad in conflict areas like Bastar or Kashmir or uh, Northeast or whatever. Mm -hmm. I say this and immediately there'll be lots of people, um, you know, who will, uh, you know, uh, including even like, really well-known people and all of that who will who otherwise think of themselves as being very democratic people very well read very democratic and all of that they will say oh look at this leftist she is always seeing things which don't happen and this is all rubbish and so you give them examples and you say that okay uh, you are saying that this stuff stopped happening in the 1990s not true it has happened here 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 fake encounters are still happening they're still happening in Kashmir they're still happening in the northeast they're still happening you know you tell them it doesn't make any difference. So they will have an answer pat for everything. Why? Because they have developed a protection mechanism to not have to really have a sleepless night thinking about the implications of their ideas, right? I think that is the problem. So likewise, I think those on the CPIM left, the Communist Party of India Marxist left, there are some of them and uh, some of them in a fairly prominent position also and other kind of others who are just kind of nameless trolls, locked profile trolls, but not all of them are locked profile trolls, mm -hmm. who are just coming out there and saying, oh, you're a CIA agent, you're a, uh, what is it, you're a, you're NATO, a NATO agent. agent, you're a fascist, you're a this, you're a that, uh, oh, you're quoting uh, Timothy Snyder, who is from Yale, how can you believe somebody from Yale? How can you believe, uh, the, uh, you know, how can you believe New York Times on Uyghur Muslims? It's New York Times, you know, it's a Western media mm -hmm. propaganda. Mm -hmm. So I keep telling them that, uh, and I, I'm, it's not, you know, at one level one could just dismiss this as something funny, you know, as pretty stupid, and it's a small number, you know, a relatively small number. But the point is, I feel that this is a mirror image of the Sangh kind of mindset. And so it worries me that, uh, that we can all be at some level uh, victims of this kind of mindset. We can protect ourselves from the facts which don't suit our own ideas. And that is a very dangerous thing because then how will we ever create a democratic society? There's the hope for that, right? 
So that I think is the question here that, you know, saying I won't believe Timothy Snyder on Ukraine, you know, the leading historian expert on Ukraine because he's from Yale or he's American or something is like saying I won't read Romila Thapar on Indian history because uh, she's from JNU and she's a le commie leftist, whatever. Who will you read? You'll read your WhatsApp forward by your Sang uh, Pramukh or whatever your local, you know, um, Shaka Pramukh or whatever it is, you know, RSS mm -hmm. guy. You'll believe uh, the WhatsApp forward over Romila Thapar. You won't even pick up Romila Thapar and read her because you are so afraid of, uh, you know, you have to dismiss the possibility of her being correct because then that would interrupt your worldview that would disturb your, your firmly held wrong belief, right? Likewise, you're saying uh, New York Times, that's exactly like the way the Sun says, oh, the wire or whatever, Hum to inko padhenge nahi. we'll not read because these are all full of lefties or whatever, right? So whatever, you know, the wire or the print or whatever it is, they're easily able to say, oh, you know, this source I won't uh, trust. And so I won't even read the facts coming from such and such source. Mm -hmm. Because I don't like, you know, the guy who's the editor or whatever it is, you know. So I feel as though that is not, uh, suppose I were to say, I know that I don't agree with uh, the editorial line in print. But suppose print does a investigative story on something that brings out some facts that are pretty disturbing to me. Okay. Suppose they are disturbing to me. Suppose they give me. So I would have to, instead of dismissing it out of hand, it must be a lie because it's print. Okay. I would have to wait, right? I would have to look at it. I would have to check its, uh, like its nuts and bolts, see whether it bears out and uh, accept the possibility that it may be bearing out, right? And make up my own mind based on facts. And if the facts are there, then I have to uh, put those facts on board in my, uh, you know, I have to reassess the situation or, or whatever I have believed till now, right? Mm -hmm. I think that how do we, uh, the larger question for me is not how I deal with trolls or whatever. That's really not the problem. The problem is how do we uh, create a, really a world in which uh, we are able to um, disagree, mm -hmm. having agreed on facts, and then we can disagree on opinions. But mm -hmm. a world in which, you know, Donald Trump or Narendra Modi are simply able to say, what I say is the truth. And everything else is fake news, you know, everything else is motivated. Everything else is just Congress propaganda or left propaganda or it is Naxal, it's Arban Naxals. So you just call somebody some name and say, you know, this. So for me, you know, China just dubbing New York Times or whatever or, uh, you know, anybody who writes about them as being imperialist propaganda or whatever. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know? mm -hmm. Come on, mm -hmm. you know. That's 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 bizarre. Why, you know, uh, what kind of, a, you're as bad as Trump, you know, then if you're mm -hmm. doing that. You're as bad as Modi, who's saying, Achha, anybody who talks about Gujarat 2002, any facts, anything, they're all part of a conspiracy, arrest them. Like Tista was arrested and Sri Kumar is still in jail. So you just aren't willing to, uh, you know, face facts. Mm. So that I think is a very dangerous situation for the whole world. And we are all grappling with it. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about Marxism and its relevance in today's India, in, yeah, yeah. in these particular socio-economic political context, right. how do you see it? How relevant it is now and... Uh, see, I yeah. think the first thing I want to say is that, see, Marxism at its best is mm -hmm. not... Mar and Marx said, I'm not a Marxist, okay? So he did not intend to, uh, you know, he wasn't writing a religious book. He wasn't saying, okay, I have, you know, he was a man in the 19th century who had, uh, 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 who did an amazing thing, which is he uh, helped us to see what lies beneath the surface of uh, the human relations in the world. So he helped us to see human relationships in a different way. He helped us to see how human relationships have become objectified, how it has become like a relationship between objects and how we, how maybe we need to create, how, how can we uh, restore, you know, human relationships to, restore the humanity to human relationships. That was what Marx was doing. Now the point is you may differ on one uh, point or another point or whatever, but I think the fundamental issue of, um, exploitation and the the, the uh, exploitative relationship, the exploitative nature of capitalism, um, uh, is I think something which uh, no one has really been able to say that's not happening. That's true, right? So I think that the uh, again, I, you know, you could be a, you know somebody could be a troll and just say, oh, you know, Marx has been proved wrong. Look at this, you know, the this collapse, Soviet Union collapse, the China's capitalist. Blah, blah, blah. So what is the point? You people are living in. 
but that's not the point right the point is if we are human beings still striving for a world that can be uh, where humans can be equal where we can um, maybe overcome climate change maybe we need not be uh, you know driven by profit and frankly that is not a that is not a worry only for the left anymore frankly all over the world human beings you know people who are uh, not necessarily uh, sort of textbook marxists or communists or whatever young people all over the world are worrying about how on earth if we continue with the kind of capitalist society we have today and economy we have today then uh, how on earth are we going to escape uh, climate change and the demise of the planet how on earth are we going to uh, ensure uh, you know avoid a pandemic and again if we can't give healthcare to everybody because you know the pandemic showed you that if your poor are vulnerable to a, a pandemic you know you the whole society is vulnerable so i think these are very real problems now the solution to those problems need not be uh, some kind of uh, formula marx didn't have an easy pat solution uh, maybe the solutions we found in the 20th century you know uh, gave a uh, pretty terrible results okay those experiments of the 20th century socialism uh, they you know i think we should agree that they are pretty uh, you know they started out with great promise but for various reasons very soon they you know uh, like banged those doors of uh, promise shut and uh, mm. turned those societies into pretty uh, terrifying dystopias mm. but that doesn't mean today that we shouldn't be looking for a way to make our planet better right make our world better our country better so a more egalitarian and all of that and when you do that i think that uh, it is inevitable that uh, you know marx uh, is very helpful in that i don't demand that everybody has to you know marx is not a religious book you don't have to say okay i swear by marx and you know so i feel very sorry for people who are always only trying to uh, you know who speak in uh, any kind of jargon you know whether it you know so i feel as though that is not helpful the point is that but but there is no denying that when you read marx uh, definitely uh, you uh, i think uh, i think it was uh, uh, who was it who called marx the great geographer of the human condition okay mm-hmm. um uh, so i i think that you know it's like that so the point is that when you read a great geographer of the human condition obviously uh, it helps you to figure out the map even in your own country here in this corner of it several centuries after marx two mm-hmm. centuries after mm-hmm. marx you're still able to uh you know it's still able to throw some light on how to fight it certainly tells you that uh you must fight it's important not just to understand the world but to change it so i think that confidence we need to keep now do we need to also learn from others do we need to do we, you know uh, again i'm i i'm very very firm about that that anyone on the left uh, should always be open and i think i am a leftist to the core okay i am that i am looking for but i think that the whole point is to also uh, be willing to look at our problems you know if if the practice of leftism is posing certain problems and these are problems shared not just by the left but by anybody concerned about democracy about climate change whatever who has the answers do capitalists have the answers they don't mm. do socialists and have the answers do you know or left parties have the answers no not everyone has all these answers let us but the point is that if we are determined that we need uh, a change and we need a better world then i think uh, you know you can uh, it is absolutely impossible to ignore marxism marxism is relevant and if we talk about the ideological war between rss bjp and the left uh, do you think the left is losing out especially uh, in its ability to connect with the masses uh, what where what's what's wrong what needs to be corrected see i think that that is not a very uh, fair question simply because you know uh, right now especially the mm-hmm. rss has uh, is probably uh, probably ha- uh, you know uh, is at a point when it has unlimited funding unlimited you know secret funding through the electoral bonds for the bjp mm-hmm. uh, it has the biggest corporations on its side it has uh, all the media on its in, in its pocket almost you know so the big media or the big television channels and so on are all in their pocket and they are trying to their governments are trying to literally like squeeze out create new rules squeeze out the youtube channels squeeze out the portal media you know squeeze out the places where uh, some pieces of real journalism actually trickle out and may reach people in any case these portals and so on don't have the kind of reach that the television channel does which goes for free into somebody's house who owns a tv right 
So I think that the, the contest between that and any opposition party in India, let alone the left, which is one of the smaller parties and which struggles, I think that there is simply no, you know, there's no comparison. The only thing is that in spite of that, you do see young people gravitating towards the left movements. You see young people, young people uh, gravitating towards uh, the left. You see uh, young people opting for left politics in you know which which means a life of a lot of privations and difficulties and uh, even a lack of safety because your life is in danger. There's a lot of uh, you know. Um, uh, there's a lot of organized violence that the left faces, especially a left like, say, you know, even CPI men in Bihar or whatever. So when I see young people coming to take up responsibility there, I think that's a great thing. And even though I'm not in the CPI men, I would still encourage, uh, you know, young people to continue being active in uh, in the CPI men, in those movements. Absolutely. I do not, uh, you know, I do not. It's just that uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think that for me, uh, it was important that these questions be raised. I would have been very happy if the CPIML itself had felt it uh, in necessary to explore these questions. But at this point, we didn't agree on that. And so, you know, we uh, sort of took uh, slightly different paths. And so in future, how do you uh, plan to pursue these questions? Well, I right now just plan to be, uh, you know, uh, writing and, uh, you know, I already am involved in a lot of movements. Um, you know, and every day there are new crises with this, uh, you know, with people who are suffering under this government. So that has been a daily part of life always. So that is going to continue. I'm always part of those movements. I may not be a part as a representative of an organization, but I will certainly be a part and do all that I can uh, as an individual. But I think apart from that, what I want to, I want to carve out the time to be uh, writing and thinking and communicating with people about democracy. So I feel that, you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings in the Indian public uh, about democracy. And I, I, I look around and I don't see uh, anyone really able to uh, talk about these things. I don't see very many. So I, I'm looking at uh, podcasts or YouTube, cha YouTube channels or whatever, which, in which I can do this. So I'll probably do something like that yeah, okay. for a while. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let's see as, um, as things pan out. I mean, but I certainly don't have any plans to... Uh, you know, join any political formation or form any political formation or anything right now. That's certainly not not on the table. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for this conversation. Please keep watching the print and subscribe us for more such content.